Afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I am Delia O'Brien. I'm the Small Ruminant Specialist at Virginia State University. Um, and this is, I believe, our fifth, I think it's our fifth webinar in the, the weekly um, worm webinar series. Um, our speaker today is going to be Dr. Kwame Matthews from Delaware State University, and he's going to be talking to us about the other enemy, coccidiosis. Okay, this webinar series is a collaboration between myself at Virginia State University, um, Dr. Matthews at Delaware State um, University, um, Susan Shanian, at University of Maryland Extension and Dr. Nikki Whitley from Fort Valley State um, University. This series goes on till June 9th. So we're hoping that you'll all be able to stick, stick with us um, through this, this, this series. And we hope that it provides some information um, that will be helpful in your, in your um, control or strategy to control worms on your farm. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Matthews to start. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. So today we'll be talking about preventing and treating coccidiosis um, in sheep and goats. So what is coccidia? So coccidia is a protozoan parasite, which is a single-celled organism that live in the intestines of the animal. So it lives mainly in the small intestine of the animal and it causes tremendous damage to the small intestine. And as we all know, your small intestine, the animal's small intestine is where it absorbs a lot of nutrients. So with coccidia causing damage to the lining of the small intestine, we can account that this parasite is gonna is very very detrimental to the longevity and also to the survivability of these animals the coccidia parasite is in the genus known as imeria which is found in sheep goats and camelids so imeria is the most popular um coccidia found in these animals However, you have I, 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 uh, isonophores, which are also um, I, um, coccidia species. So the survival of coccidia is a uh, long-term survival because coccidia will live in the environment for many years. It can actually survive through the winter. It can also survive um, when it's warm. So it's a, it's a, Parasite that normally affects your animals, um, mainly when they're housed inside. So when they're housed in confinement, this is when this parasite is most detrimental. Um, their infection is very high at most points. However, um, it causes limited, it, it, even though most of your animals might be infected with coccidia, it doesn't mean that they're gonna show signs of coccidiosis, meaning they're not showing the disease, but a lot of them might be infected with the coccidia parasite. With coccidia parasite, it is more important or more severe in younger animals between the ages of, from birth all the way to about six months is when they start to show some after six months, they start showing some immunity to coccidia. When they're about a year old, that's when they actually show strong immunity to coccidia. And at that point, they are normally able to fight the coccidia off if they make it to that old. With coccidia, adult, adult animals are normally um, sources for infection. So, the mothers normally pass, normally spread it in the um, barn when you're kidding and or lambing. And if you're kidding or lambing on the inside, their mothers are normally going to shed these parasites, which the animal, the young animal is going to consume it. And that is why it is detrimental to the young animal. If you think about um, the younger the animal, the less its immune system is working. 
So its immune system is not firing as good as the older animals. And that is why with the younger animals, coccidia will tend to stay on the inside and cause more damage to the small intestine. With the older animals, their body is used to it, so their immune system is stronger, and then their immune system starts to fight the coccidia instead of allowing it to um, proliferate within the body. Even though there are many species of Imeria, only a few species actually causes um, coccidiosis in the animal or causes some clinical signs in the animal. There, there are more than 10 species that affect sheep and goat. However, with sheep, there is only two major species that causes all the damage. With, sheep, with goats, there's four species and also with camelids, there are four species. Um, these are species specific and therefore the parasite, the, the coccidia found in sheep and goats does not affect, or the coccidia found in that affect sheep does not affect goats. And I know I get this question a lot. People tend to ask if a chicken is in the same posture as um, goat, would the goat get the coccidia from the chicken? And that, that does not work because coccidia is species specific. The only animals that are so far that can transfer the coccidia to each other are camelids. So llama, alpaca, um, and camels, they all get the same coccidia species. And those are the only ones that it will affect um, tremendously. Um, once the oocysts, which are similar to eggs, um, these, once these are actually within the small intestine and they start to replicate, it will cause a lot of damage to your small intestine. So just one um, oocyst can cause at least 5 million intestinal cells to be ruptured. And if it's causing 5 million intestinal cells to be ruptured, that is limiting the amount of um, nutrients that the animal is gonna uptake. Okay, so the life cycle of coccidia is a little bit different from um, roundworms because as I said before, coccidia is a protozoa. The only thing that's similar really is that the coccidia does have an external environmental stage to its life cycle, which is similar to, to roundworms because they all have free living, a free living stage, or most roundworms have a free living stage. Um, so the, this um, coccidia is passed out into the manure of the feast of the animal. And once the coccidia is passed out into the manure of the animal, then when it's out in the environment and the environment is um, cool, when it's cool and or warm and moist, then the coccidia eggs will start to develop or they will start to become more mature. And then once they get to their infective stage, which is here at number three on this slide, um, then the animal is, the animal consumes this infective stage of the parasite. And that infective stage of the parasite then goes on into the animal stomach, goes through the small intestine where it starts to undergo more, more maturation and it starts penetrating the lining of the cells. With coccidia, when they are ready to, um, when they're ready to multiply, most of the time, they're gonna rupture the cells. So they're gonna rupture the cells in order to get out, to, to get into other cells of the animal. So all the time, that is why it says that one parasite can affect at least 5 million cells because every time that parasite grows and it goes through asexual rep replication, then what is going to happen is that it is going to rupture the cell and it's gonna move on to another cell. And when it ruptures the cell, it's multiple parasites that come out of the cell at the same time, and then it moves on to the next um, cell. 
coccidia causes um, symptoms that are subclinical and clinical. So the subclinical symptoms of coccidia um, include stuff like low, lower feed consumption, poor growth and weight loss, poor utilization of feed, soft poop, and in some cases, or most cases when they're subclinical, they do not show any signs immediately. So immediately looking at them, you might think that, okay, these animals are nice and healthy. However, they're not healthy. They're actually spreading it around and it takes a longer time for you to, for you to get rid of it. With some clinical coccidiosis, what will happen is that this will last for a long term. So it will last for a long term of infection because you really don't know that your animal is infected. And if you don't know for sure that your animal is infected, then you won't be able, you won't treat it when you're supposed to treat it. And then it, when you really notice it, it's when it's actually really bad. With clinical, um, you can notice clinical. Most of the time you notice your clinical um, symptoms would, because of diarrhea. So diarrhea is one of the most common um, symptom that you will see with, with clinical coccidiosis. The diarrhea is sometimes, is most times watery and it may or may not have in blood. Uh, another thing that it causes is anemia, failure to thrive, so the animal won't survive too long. Um, sometimes it causes rough hair coat, the animal look depressed, the animal may be dehydrated, and in serious cases, the animals will die. If you don't treat um, coccidia as soon as you find it, most of the time it will continue to spread and it will continue um, to cause damage to the animal's small intestine. So in order to identify coccidia in animals, what we normally do or what, what you're normally supposed to do is look at different signs. So you're, you can look at clinical signs and say the animal have coccidia. However, because the clinical signs are similar to other diseases, it is very hard sometimes to tell that the animal have coccidia without actually coupling the clinical signs with fecal egg count. The thing with fecal egg counting or fecal osis, os, oocyte counting, it's that even though it is a quantitative way of diagnosing um, him on the coccidia parasite within the animal, the problem is animals can have very, very, very high oocyte counts and it does not, and they, the animal does not show any symptoms at all. So the animal can have, it is not rare to see up to 75,000 to 100,000 eggs per gram when you do an osis count. It's not rare. Um, you might see that. And when you see that, most of the time, the animal, if it's not showing any signs, then most of the time, people tend to want to treat the animal, which we normally give a treatment. However, if the, the animal does not always have to show signs when it has these high levels of um, oocytes. With the osis counts, it varies drastically because you can have an animal that has a very low count and have more symptoms or is more devastated, the, the damage is more devastating than in the animal that has a lot of osis counts. So you have to think about, you can't just use that as your only method of diagnosis. However, you can couple it with clinical symptoms. And when you couple it with clinical symptoms, then you will know for sure this animal is, going, is having some type of effect from coccidia. With, when your animal dies, you can also do a necropsy. And if your animal dies and you do a necropsy, you can see the nodules. As you can see in this image, you'll see the nodules on the small intestine, intestinal lining. So you know that coccidia is actually present in your um, herd. So
So, in order to battle with coccidia, the things that you need to do most, it is better to prevent than cure anything. So it is better to try to prevent coccidiosis. It is better to try to prevent coccidia coming in your herd or being in your herd in high numbers or in your barn or your area. So the first thing that you need to practice is good sanitation. So good sanitation is one of the number one things that we can practice where we can control in order to keep coccidia out of our animals or keep coccidia levels very low. So young animals should be kept in a clean, dry environment. As I stated before, the younger animals are more susceptible. So with the younger animals being more susceptible, you wanna ensure that they are kept in, a, in the right environment. So you wanna clean your environment as much as possible. You wanna replace your bedding within a shelter or in your, in your barn. You have to replace those bedding and make sure the bedding is dry. So what you could do, you can add some absorbent under the bedding, which will help with keeping on, on the flooring dry and in turn keeping the bedding dry. Uh, you wanna keep your lambs um, your lambing and kidding pens clean. So if you're lambing and kidding, you make sure you clean after every animal has been removed from the lambing and kidding pen. So you don't put back any younger young animal in a dirty pen because coccidia loves dirt. Coccidia loves that moisture and it loves that warm temperature inside of the straw. So prevent overcrowding. So you want to make ensure that your animals are not crowded on top of each other. So there, there's adequate space for your animals to utilize the barn and without consume, constantly consuming fecal matter or, or getting in contact with fecal matter. So you wanna follow the established guidelines for housing. Um, and most of these guidelines are based on the idea of the animal's age, the area, um, species, and if the animals have horn or not, you wanna add, if they have some horn, you might wanna give them a little bit more space than if they don't have horns. That's, that would prevent the aggression from one animal to the next, and also will prevent damage if the animal headbutts the other. So clean your feeders and waters. If, if possible, try to disinfect your waters and feeders um, daily. So if, if it is possible, you try to defect, um, disinfect it daily or at least once a week, try to disinfect the waters to clean it out so that there is nothing growing inside the water or so that the eggs doesn't hatch or um, the eggs doesn't sporulate inside the water. Uh, keep them higher off the ground. So try not to feed your animals on the ground. Don't just throw the feed out there because when you throw the feed on the ground, what is going to happen is that your animal is going to start defecating, passing feces all over the, the hay. And or if you have grain on the ground, then it is mixed in with fecal matter. And once you have fecal matter, there's a probability of you having uh, a lot of oocytes on the ground. You wanna, so you wanna elevate your water and your feeder. You want to try to move it if, if possible, try to move around your feeder and water because animals normally congregate where your feeder is and they congregate where your water is. So the more, the more they congregate in one area, it's the more these animals are going to shed their coccidia load and then your young animals will pick up the coccidia. Another thing that you have to think about is if your water is leaking, you want to make sure that you can clog that water from leaking because the animals are gonna congregate around the water area. And if it is already wet, then you know that the coccidia is going to be sitting there and waiting for them to uh, come around. When the animals are eating from that area, 
then the animals are going to consume a lot more coccidia. So you want to disinfect your barns or pen um, every time you move a group from your barn. So coccidia is a parasite that will live on the environment for a while. So if you leave the straw there, your animal is going to, the coccidia is going to stay in the straw. Coccidia is going to enjoy that warmth of the straw. And then at some point when you put your animals back in that barn, the coccidia is going to affect your animals drastically. So you want to clean your barn out, so remove the straw and disinfect the barn to kill any type of um, remaining bacteria and or coccidia. So good nutrition is also a preventative method. When you have good nutrition for your animals, what will happen is that your animal will have a higher immune system or higher, uh, more adequate immune response. And with that being said, your animal is going to, um, the immune system is going to fight the coccidia infestation more than you having to treat it. So if you're feeding your animals poorly, then you're going to increase stress in your animals and your animals are going to not produce um, a good immune response to coccidia getting inside the animal. So you want to feed your animals properly. Another thing is if you feed your dams, if you feed the mothers ahead or you feed them good quality feed, then what will happen is that they will produce good quality product um, colostrum, which will give your kids or lambs some immunity so that they can help to fight off coccidia within the first couple of weeks of life. So if you're feeding them correctly, you're meeting your nutrient requirement during the lambing and kidding time, then your animal will get adequate colostrum. And this adequate colostrum is going to allow your animals to eventually uh, fight off some of the coccidia load. They might not fight it for the rest of their life, but they'll fight most of it off. Stress is one of the biggest problems in animals that when they're stressed out, they actually have heavy coccidia loads, and this coccidia will cause severe damage to your animals. So stress in young animals can affect their immunity. So if your animals are stressed, then they normally do not um, have one of the best immune response. They do not generate the best immune response to any type of disease if they're stressed out. So you want to reduce as much stress as possible. One of the stressors that people use and not realize is aggressive handling. So when you aggressively handle your animals, you're also stressing your animals out. And at that point, your animals will be stressed when you leave them in, in a pen and they will be, con your, their immune system will not be functioning as rapid as it's supposed to and that will lead to more devastating damage from coccidia. So try to separate large, larger animals from the smaller ones. So the less dominant animals, then what will happen is if you leave your runt in with your uh, more dominant animals, they're gonna continue to pick on your runt or they're gonna continue to pick on your smaller animals, which is gonna cause your smaller animal to have a less of a fighting chance immune wise and also your weaker animal is not going to be able to get into your feeder to, consume, to get enough good quality feed in order to help its immune response or its immune system and its body's development. When you get, when you purchase new animals or new animals are coming into your herd, you want to quarantine your animal. So you quarantine your animals, meaning you're going to isolate them. So you're going to isolate them in an area, one, where they can see other animals. They might not come in contact. They should not be coming in contact with your other animals. But you can isolate them where they can see other animals. And that will reduce some of the stress. And also, when you quarantine them, 
prior to introducing them to your herd, it allows your animals to become acquainted with the environment. It, become, it allows them to reduce stress before they actually go into your herd. Because all that transportation for your animals normally increases the stress level of your animals. And then once you bring them to your herd, if you just throw them in the herd, one, you can introduce new things to your herd, which you shouldn't do. And two, the animals are gonna, the, the herd is going to pick on that animal a lot more than normal because it's a new animal. They're gonna wanna show dominance again. And at that point, your animal is gonna be too stressed to fight. And when it's too stressed to fight, you're only going to cause damage to your animal. If you quarantine your animal, you should quarantine for at least 28 days so that you can have your animal tested. You can deworm your animal to get rid of all the um, parasites. And if you can do a check to see about coccidia, then you can also treat for coccidia during that time period. So that you know when you introduce your animal to the herd, you're introducing an animal that is clean from all other um, sickness, they're clean from other parasites, or at least have very, very low limits of parasite. That way you can manage your herd. Uh, <clears throat> another time that is very stressful to your animals is weaning. So during weaning, that's, a, that's a, one of your stressors for your younger animals. For the most part, your younger animals are going to be stressed during weaning because they're about to be separated from their mothers. When you wean, most of the time we wean and you should not wean and move your animal, your younger animals from the area that they are actually more comfortable with. So when you're weaning your animals, leave them in the, leave the kids in the familiar area. You can move the mothers to the new area because even though it will add some stress to the mothers, it will add more stress to your younger animals. And when it adds stress to your younger animals, then it increases your chances of coccidiosis a lot more because that's added stress. Some people have, or some producers and research has been done for doing fence line feeding. So fence line weaning so that the animals can, the younger animals can come in contact with their mothers, which will help to limit the stress. So they have their mothers for a short period of time, not very long. However, that will help to limit the stress because they can actually see them and they can sit by the fence line without stressing out drastically. You wanna keep weanlings together and do not mix your weanlings with older animals because the older animals are gonna pick on your weanlings. So once your older animals are in, they're going to fight your weanlings in order to get more feed and then to um, create dominance again. So they want to show who is boss within the system and therefore, if you mix them together, that is going to add stress. So limit the stress. Adjust feeding schedule for your young animals before weaning. That way you're not dumping feed to your young animals when after they have been weaned. You want to ensure that they're used to getting fed. So they're used to consuming grain. At that point, if you're, they're used to consuming grain and if you're feeding hay, they're used to consuming hay by the time um, they are weaned. So you want to introduce it into the pasture while they are into their environment while their mother is still there so they can get used to it. Okay, so even though weaning and um, all the other prevention methods are linked to management, you can also use coccidiostats, which is very well, um, are very, very important. And it's something that we recommend that you use in your herd or flock 
is a coccidiostat to help with the prevention of coccidiosis. So most of the coccidiostats can be added to feed mineral or water or to the milk replacer as per the label direction. With milk replacer, most milk replacer, if you read their label, have their, they come with the coccidiostat in it. And you can purchase medicated feed, which says coccidiostat, which is the medication, which they consider as the medication. So if you look at the cox feed with coccidiostat in it, then you can feed those to your younger animals. Nine times out of 10, you want to feed it to the younger animals and you want to feed it to the mothers before they give birth. So you want to start feeding it probably about two weeks before they give birth. So that way, the, the idea behind it is that if you feed it to their mothers, the mother is going to pass off some of, the, um, some of this immunity to their offspring. So when you're feeding it, you want to ensure that you feed your animals um, when within their first couple weeks of life, you, you ensure that they're getting some coccidia start. Coccidia start does not eliminate coccidia or it doesn't 100% get rid of your chance of having coccidia, but it will limit the load, the coccidia load. The effectiveness depends on how often, on your timing when you're feeding it and what your dosage is. In for coccidia stats, cox, several there are several coccidia stats that are approved for use in sheep and goats, or in both. With the coccidia stat being approved in sheep and goat, we tend to use them um, outside of uh, what they're approved for. However, you should always get a veterinary client a patient relationship in order to use these as extra label. So we tend to use them extra label. However, you should always get a vet's idea in order, a veterinarian's idea on how to use them if you're using them extra label. So in the United States, we have monensin, which the common name is romensin, and then um, monovet 90 was approved last year for use in goats. So monensin is approved for use in goats in confinement, and it should be mixed in feed at 20 grams per ton based on the label. So if you mix it according to the label, this is what you will be mixing. In countries outside of the US, um, several countries, monensin is also approved for use in sheep. But in the United States, it is not approved. It is not FDA approved for use in sheep. And most of the time is used extra label. If it is mixed in feed outside of the US, it is approved to be mixed in at 15 grams per ton in feed. And then it is fed to your animals. If you're mixing um, monensin, if you're mixing it in your feed, try to keep it away from equine because it is toxic to equine. It can be toxic if mixed incorrectly, but it, it definitely is toxic to equine. Other coccidia stats include um, Bovatec. So Bovatec is approved for use in sheep in confinement, and it is mixed in the feed at 30 grams per ton. <clears throat> Additionally, in other countries, um, Bovatec is also approved for use in goats. In the United States, it is not. And in the other countries that it is approved for use, it is fed at five milligram per kilogram of body weight. It is calculated that way, and then it is mixed into the feed. The coquinate is also a coccidia stat. That is, this is the only one that is actually FDA approved for use in both sheep and goats. So it, it is approved for use in lambs and kids, and it can be mixed into feed at 
13.6 grams per ton of feed and or it, it is fed at 0.5 milligram per kilogram body weight daily. So if you, as I said before, you want to feed your dams before they give birth. You can feed them 21 days. You can feed them two weeks, but 21 days, up to 21 days before they give birth. And then you want to feed your growing animals. You want to feed them up to, at least up to weaning. You do not want to feed a coccidious that year round, unless you're kidding year round and your animal is, um, you're feeding it to different animals year round or different animals at different time of year. But you don't want to just feed it, mix it into your feed and continuously feed it year round. You want to feed it during the times when the animals are most susceptible to the, uh, co the coccidia, to coccidia. So treatments. So coccidia stats are not treatments. And when we talk about the coccidia stats, you have to remember that the coccidia stats are there for preventative methods. They're not there for you to treat the animals after they have coccidia or they're showing signs of coccidia. At that point, when they're showing signs of coccidia, you have to use, utilize some type of treatment for these animals. Unfortunately, for sheep, go sheep and goats, there is no approved or no FDA approved drug for treating coccidia. There is none that is approved for use in sheep and goats. Therefore, all drugs that are used in the United States to treat sheep and goats for coccidia is used on an extra label drug usage. So you should be consulting a vet in order to treat your animals with a coccidia drug, a coccidia treatment. Amprolium, also known as Corid, is one that we can buy over the counter. However, you should consult your vet before treating. It can be used as a preventative and it can also be used as a treatment. With the coccidia, with the um, with Corid, when it is used as a preventative, it is not as effective as if it is used as a treatment. So it is more effective as a treatment than as a preventative. <clears throat> you have sulfur drugs, so the sulfonamides, um, which include sulfamethazine, sulfadimethazine, and sulfoquinoxaline, which are all the sulf sulfonamides. These are all um, <clears throat> these are all uh, antibiotics and require veterinary di um, direction to use these. You require a vet to actually get a hold of these drugs. And if you buy them over, over the counter, you should still consult with a veterinarian before using these drugs. Tultrazuril, which is not approved in the United States for use, we, um, however, in other countries across the world, you can find Tultrazuril, which is effective in controlling uh, coccidia. The, um, Diclazuril is also effective. However, again, not approved for use in the United States. It is not sold in the United Some of these are not sold in the United States. And if they are found in the United States, might not be from, may or may not be from a reputable um, company. And then you have Ponazuril, which research has shown that this could be used in sheep, in goats. However, it is approved for use in horses and not for other animals. So if you're going to use any of these drugs here, a vet have to give you um, the, the right information and a veterinarian will have to prescribe these drugs for you. With Corid, because it's bought over the counter, a lot of people tend to buy Corid. You still require veterinary approval when you're buying these drugs because it is being used extra label. So if you look at the dosage here, 
I am, you can use Corid in water. So you can use the 9.6% uh, Corid in water and it is fed to your animals based on five milligram of amprolium per kilogram body weight. This is a preventative method. And when you do this as a preventative method, this is what was, this is what is on the labor for cattle. And this is why I said, you have to consult with a vet before utilizing any of these drugs. Same with the treatment. You can feed, you can give up to 10 milligram per kilogram for five days. And this is also the cattle dosage. So you want to consult your vet before utilizing. If you're actually giving Corid, Corid acts as a blocker for thymine. So it will cause thymine def deficiency in your animal. If you overdose Corid, it will lead to polio. So if, it is, if you're feeding Corid, a lot of time you want to have, ensure that you're feeding it right or you're giving it right and you're not prolonging the use of Corid. Again, it will cause um, polio from thymine deficiency because it acts as an agonist or an antagonist for the choline receptor, the, the thymine receptors. So it binds to the thymine receptors, preventing thymine from binding, and then it will cause the animal to have a thymine deficiency. So the sulfonamides, these are your sulfonamides, um, and these must be obtained from a veterinarian and should be used according to the extra label drug law. So therefore your veterinarian will have to prescribe the amount of dosage that you will need to use in your flock or herd. Other options based on research would include Ponazuril. So Ponazuril, even though it is not approved for use in your herd, here you have to think about the idea that Ponazuril is actually, you, has been tested in research and in research it has shown to have a, a good effect on your animals. It has shown to reduce fecal osis count when administered at a single dose. For other um, natural, dewer, natural products that could be used includes Cerisa lespedeza, which has been effective in reducing fecal osis. And then you have oregano essential oil, which has also been used to reduce um, fecal osis in sheep and goats. However, there's not a lot of study done with oregano essential oil. There are more studies done with Cerisa lespedeza than with um, oregano essential oil. The oregano essential oil needs more research before we can recommend people using it. At the moment, we don't recommend it, but that is what is going on. Um, it, thank you. And if you have any questions, I am open to take them now.